Good morning and welcome to EWTN's live and complete coverage of the 10th National Eucharistic Congress. I'm your host, Catherine Hadro, coming to you from Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis. And once again, I am delighted to be joined by my two co-hosts throughout this week. Father Aquinas Gilbo is a Dominican priest and the university chaplain and vice president of ministry and mission at the Catholic University of America. And Pete Burak is vice president of Renewal Ministries, which seeks to foster renewal in the Catholic Church through the power of the Holy Spirit for the salvation of souls. Good morning, great to be with you both on this third day of the National Eucharistic Congress. Behind us here in the stadium, we're having more and more attendees trickle in. Prayers are happening behind us. Preparation for the mass that is underway here in Lucas Oil Stadium as the day kicks off. And every day has had a theme this week. Today, it's into Gethsemane, and I think we're already starting to see that theme trickle out throughout this morning. Exactly, I think with the organizers want us to focus on today with this theme into Gethsemane is is the healing and the reconciliation that comes to us as a fruit of Christ's passion. So it is Friday on, Ca on Fridays we Catholics focus on the passion and death uh, in resurrect uh, passion and death of the Lord in yeah. our devotional lives. Just looking at the stage this morning, there's a, a change of scenery. The, not only the color change, but also the image in the middle. It's it's the crown of thorns. Yes. And so to again pull us into Gethsemane, the Lord's prayer for his people, the Lord's prayer of preparation for his passion, but focusing on the healing, the peace, the reconciliation, ultimately the joy mm. that's the fruit of, of his passion. Absolutely, Pete. And there's great hope today, right? It is it is a day to focus on being healed and being restored to the Lord and to each other. And Bishop Cousins reminded us of kind of what the Lord encourages us to do in these moments when at the very opening session, mm -hmm. he quoted and prayed 2 Chronicles 7:14, which of course we're all familiar with, but let me remind you of what it says. It says this, if my people who are called by my name, Christians, mm. humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I mean, if that doesn't encapsulate exactly what we need in the American church in particular, a healing of our land, a forgiveness of our sins, and it starts with acknowledging God for who he is, seeking his face, remembering who we are in him, we're called by his name, and then letting God do what God does. And, and what, one of the things he does is he heals and he restores and he revives, which is the very pr purpose of why we're here. Absolutely. You know, again, I think the organizers have done a really beautiful job um, walking with us throughout the different themes, walking with us and now walking with us to this theme of repentance. Again, on day one, from the four corners, we kicked off those four pilgrimage routes coming together. Day two, the greatest love story, and now into Gethsemane. Last night, one of the keynote speakers was Father Mike Schmitz, um, very well known with his popular podcast, Bible in a Year, Catechism in a Year. He spoke to yesterday's theme, but it hit on repentance. Right. And he was saying that you cannot have a revival without repentance. And talking about how Jesus is the only bridge between God and man, and that sacrifice is necessary. We're preparing for the mass here. And Father Mike Schmitz was was reminding us the, the purpose of the mass is the sacrifice. It's not just to be in Jesus's presence, as beautiful as it is, it is that sacrifice. That's right, I, another scripture that comes to mind is just the words of the Lord himself. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people mm. to myself. Mm. As the, the Lord himself is the source of, of peace, that healing, that reconciliation. But to draw all people to himself, when he's lifted up, that means the people have to turn <laughs> to him. It's not like they're already heading in the right direction when he's lifted up. No, he's lifted up and it catches the world's attention, draws the world to himself, which means he turns the world to himself. And that turning is the very you know, meaning of the word conversion you know, mm -hmm. and the reconciliation that's that's at the heart of every conversion. Yeah, that metanoia moment, right? Mm -hmm. to, to be going in one direction, to encounter the Lord in a real and personal way, and then to drop your nets, lay down in front of him, humble yourself and say, I, I need a savior and to t turn back. And I think this is what we've been building through. It's been woven through the entire mm -hmm. Congress so far as just the, the reality of Christ's presence here, but also the reality of then what he offers to us, he extends to us. He extends his love, he extends his mercy, but he also says, now what's your response? And so 
what's been beautiful about the way it's been organized and I mm -hmm. think we can expect today is just more opportunities to respond. You know, and the Lord never stops seeking. He never stops extending. And so for the participants here and for everyone watching with us, this is another moment of grace, another Kairos moment, another God moment where he, he breaks into our lives and then says, what's your response? Do you, do you want to follow me or not? And my prayer is that we respond and we follow. And it, as we're saying, it does require an action from all, every single one of us. Again, Father Mike Schmitz made this really helpful advice. Think about if your fire, if that love, that fire you have for Jesus, if it's dimmed, what are the fire extinguishers? Right. You have to identify it and then you better make a change. And when, we're, when we go to the sacrament of reconciliation, you have to go with the intention of, I will sin no more. Mm -hmm. But that requires, again, that radical change and realignment, but we are called to that. And I think that's part of the genius of focusing our attention today on Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. Because by focusing on the Lord's passion, it's not, we see that the one who calls us to himself for reconciliation, he's calling us from within himself, sinless, suffering the penalty and mm -hmm. the effects of our sins, taking upon himself the sin of the world. And it's from that passion, from that suffering, he invites us in. You know, And so, so it's not a, a question of, the call to conversion coming from the outside in a in a in a condemnatory way. No, God is already in the suffering that we've caused mm. by our sins and invites us into His participation in that. Not participation. His His willingly and loving you know, taking on of that suffering Himself. And it's in the Lord's suffering, in the passion in Gethsemane, that we find the source of our healing. Again, talking about how you know pairing repentance are the love for communion with the sacrament of reconciliation and how they really must go together. Father, I'm just thinking we all have different vocations here. You have this unique perspective as priest right. in the confessional. Yeah. Do you mind just even reflecting on the gift that the con that confession is yeah. and how you get to live palpably that mercy? Right. It's one of the, my favorite things to do mm. <laughs> is, to, is to hear confessions. Why? Because it is such a moment of grace for the people who come and a moment of peace, joy, because of the reconciliation that takes place there. Just on the, on the campus of Catholic University, I've just seen the effect. The more we offer confession, the more the students come, you know, and, and not for, uh, you know, unserious or unnecessary reasons. We're all in need of, mm -hmm. of, of deep healing and, and serious reconciliation. Uh, and it is the joy, it should be the joy of every priest to make that as available uh, to everyone as possible. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a sign of a healthy church and a healthy parish when there are those confessional times that are offered. Yeah, and it's a sacrament of great hope, too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a firm assurance that God has done something in me, that he's transformed me, that he's, he's wiped me clean, mm -hmm. and now I can live differently, empowered by him. And confessions have been offered this entire time. I mean, there's there's mm -hmm. priests everywhere. Right. There's mm -hmm. bishops everywhere. You can't go five feet without running into somebody who could heal you of your sins yes. through the power of the Holy Spirit in, in Jesus Christ. And so uh, the opportunity to just continue to respond to the Lord's grace, again, it's, it's for the participants here, but it's also for the people at home. I just can't stress mm -hmm. enough that our sense that that you are active participants in this journey with us. As you watch through the screen, Jesus is not confined by technology. He's moving across the earth and he's moving across everybody's living room or wherever you happen to be watching. So to respond to that grace today, that there's something special, there's an anointing. Uh, the sense I had is that the Lord wants to reveal his glory today through Gethsemane. There's something profoundly glorious about what we see in Jesus in Gethsemane, the trust of his father, the, the suffering he's enduring, but the great hope and the reason, what does scripture tell us? Why does Jesus endure the cross? For the hope that was to come, the glory that was coming through his obedience to the father. Absolutely, and we'll continue to speak on this theme throughout the day. But before we officially kick off day three, let's first look back at the busy and beautiful day that was yesterday at the National Eucharistic Congress. Roselle Spirits Rages are had that renewed. report. Hearts are full. The theme for Thursday night's revival session is The Greatest Love Story. The event kicked off with Lila Rose, founder and president of the pro life organization Live Action. She spoke about her life changing first encounter with the Eucharist that she felt such a great love from Jesus that it made her convert to Catholicism. She prayed to Jesus, asked to be used by him to do great things, to speak for the unborn as a pro-life activist. 
She asked the faithful to do the same. There are 50,000 people here in the stadium tonight. Imagine if each one of us asked our Lord, use me. If we said, do whatever you want with me, Lord. Imagine what God can do. MC Monsi Alvarado then interviewed the parents of Michelle Dupong, the focus missionary who might be beatified soon. Ken and Mary Ann Dupong spoke about family life, their home rooted in Christ, and how that helped shape Michelle's exceptional love for our Lord. Your example for your children is a real big influence. If you go to Mass, they see you do that, they will do that in the future. Everything you do, they watch. And that is probably the best thing you can do, is give them a good example of what to do. Mother Olga of the Sacred Heart took the stage after and started with song and prayer. With Mother Olga said she endured four wars and many Eucharist. personal tragedies, and it was and Our Lady and the Sacred the Heart of Eucharistic Jesus that Eucharistic. saved her. The last speaker of the night is Father Mike Schmitz. No stranger to the limelight, he gave us words of wisdom and reminds us of Jesus' sacrifice for us. When you see the Lord lifted up like this, you are looking at Calvary. When you see the Lord lifted up like this, you're participating in his restoration of the world. When you get to be going to Mass, and here is the priest holding up our Lord like this and just saying, God, Father, this is for you. After inspiring stories of Jesus' love for us from all of the speakers to end night two of the National Eucharistic Congress, a procession and candlelight Eucharistic adoration. The entire stadium turning to the Lord in the Eucharist and worshiping him. Stay. We caught up with some of the attendees. Here's what they had to say. Tonight I love seeing Mother Olga. She was wonderful. I loved her stories of the miracles and the Eucharist and what she has seen throughout her life, her story. And then of course Father Mike Schmitz. He's just wonderful. There's no words to express getting to see him. It, it was just totally awesome. It really stood out to me when I just looked out and the, when the kids were just like paying attention and like they taking it all in. Um, and I knew that's why I was here. Um, Father Mike just spoke uh, to everyone and just said that we were all just so worthy of, um, of Christ, no matter how much you know, how much you don't know. And I think that really stood out to me. I think it was an important message to spread to everyone that we were, were worthy. I remember Father said, um, lack of knowledge or our brokenness, it does not disqualify us. But what uh, is important that makes us sing is just love. My favorite part was when uh, is in adoration where you can just meditate about God in your life. I love witnessing um, 50,000 people here as one big family um, adoring Christ. I loved it when I saw 50,000 people drop to their knees in adoration. It was just inspiring and amazing. It was really beautiful to see all these people singing and praising God. Uh, my favorite part tonight was adoration in the Blessed Sacrament. Reporting from Indianapolis, Rasal Rages, EWTN News. Such stunning scenes. It was great to relive the night that was last night, that revival session, and to hear from families. I'm reminded that there are so many young families who are here. You look around, you see people of all different ages, but um, to hear, you know, this is going to stay with these children who are here as well. Yeah, we can talk about this maybe with our next guest. Right. Uh, but uh, the youthfulness of the Congress, not something I expected. I don't think anybody was really expecting, uh, but just the number of young people who have come in. Not families, just families with their young children, but teenagers, young adults. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the stadium is filled with, with young people. I mean, how inspiring is it to uh, that last clip? Mm -hmm. What's your favorite part of What do you remember? And my favorite right. part is Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, mm -hmm. Eucharistic Adoration. 
I mean, where is that? Where right. is that happening right. anywhere else? I mean, yes, there's little <laughs> pockets around the country, but how, how profound to go across the world on the airways that this young man was the best part of his day yesterday was seeing and encountering Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. I mean, that is the type of thing that fuels revival. And again, there were these great keynote speakers that were familiar with their name. We heard from Lila Rose, Father Mike Schmitz, Mother Olga, but then also the Japong family, mm -hmm. this humble family whose daughter is now, her cause for canonization is open. She died right. young in her 30s. She was a focused missionary right. who, who had a heroic witness with cancer. Um, that's a great reminder for us all as well that we are all made for sainthood. That's what sticks with me about last night. You just saw the fruitfulness of the Eucharist at all the states of life in the church. Mm -hmm. A priest, a religious sister, a young wife and mother, and an older married couple. And you saw in each, according to their own particular lives and particular circumstances, the fruit, the absolute fruitfulness of the Eucharist. Yeah, they were all transformed in different ways mm -hmm. to then be the body of Christ on the earth. And, and the Eucharist fuels the body. Right. Amen. Well, we'll continue our conversation shortly, but first we're going to take a quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back to our ongoing coverage of the National Eucharistic Congress. We are joined now by Tanner Kalina. He is currently serving with the National Eucharistic Congress as a mission outreach manager. Tanner is also an actor. Viewers may remember him from the exclusive EWTN web series, James the Last. Tanner, great to meet you. Great to meet you as well. Great to have you here. Thanks for all the work that you've been pouring into this event here this week. Day three, would love to hear your impression so far and your experience so far. Well, thank you. I, I, I got to, I mean, my staff, the staff, my, the people I get to call coworkers have done just a fantastic job. Sarah Hood and her team, uh, Jason Shanks, Joel Stepanek, Chris Frank, Tim Glimkowski. I mean, those guys have really put together something special. And, and it's palpable. It's in the air. So the Lord is really tangibly doing something right now. And I, none of us really know what it is, but I think we all suspect it. And it's just, it's really... It's really cool seeing the prayer of our bishops, the prayer of our staff mm -hmm. for multiple years now, like like in people's eyes and, and seeing it, just like the excitement building. It's really, really special. It's beautiful. I think in the build up to the Congress, I, mean, I think what we've all been expecting or many people were expecting that, you know, that what is the Congress? Well, it's going to be like seek, but for your grandma, you know, <laughs> and, and it's yeah. not turned out to be that. I mean, we're just talking before the break at how young the crowd mm -hmm. is. What, what impressions do you have there? We, you know, we haven't had a, a National Eucharistic Congress in 83 years. And so there's a whole generation of, you know, someone could have been born 82 years ago and lived a whole life and never once touched one of these. And so I think right now also our, our bishops are empowering our youth. Um, some of these bishops, like Bishop Espeyat, grew up with Sikhs. He grew up with NCYCs. And you have this whole generation who's like returning to... Um, gathering together, something that used to be a part of our past, and, and, and they're really entrusting the youth. Uh, our staff is relatively uh, young to be putting together something like this. Sarah Hood's very young, Tim Glimkowski's very young, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just really special. So I think just right now, the, the future is not in the future, the future is like now, and, and everyone, whether you're, you're one years old or you're 80, you're 180. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. even a real age. Hey. Like, this is your time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tanner, one of the things I've appreciated about you in getting to know you and then following you on social media and different things is just you you have a deep love for the Lord in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from, and how did that fuel your desire to, to serve in this capacity? Oh, thanks for asking that. And I think it's uh, it's good that today is, the, the theme of today is into Gethsemane, where we're, where we're looking into our wounds and our brokenness uh, to allow the Lord's light to shine in there. And, and that's how I fell in love with the Lord. It was truly through like just a really kind of heavy moment in my life, just really in dire need, heartbroken, crushed, lost, um, lacking purpose, and, and just having to take a leap and, and decide like, am I actually Catholic? Do I actually believe Jesus is really there? Because if so, I need to go all in. And, and when I took that leap, I just saw him slowly put my heart back together and um, where he took me from, I like, I'm in constant and, and eternal awe and like it's my mission, my life to like share that with people because 
that's not just for me. That's for all of us. He can take you and he can make you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You mentioned that this is the first National Eucharistic Congress in the U.S. in 83 years. Now, in 2024, people who are not physically able to be here, they can join online. They can listen on radio as well. I encourage our viewers to go to EWTN.com forward slash Eucharist, see all the programming. But 83 years ago, we didn't have that. Can you tell us about the digital outreach aspect of this, Tanner, and what you're seeing online and, and what you've been doing to reach more people? Sure. So for all those at home, I've been helping run our media team, working with just like A-list photographers. I mean, these guys are the cream of the crop and working with Lux Lab Studios, a great videography team. And I've been helping with social media, so I've been kind of got like an inside look on, on how this is penetrating these walls and getting out there. And one, I've been hearing EWTN has been doing a great job. So thank you, <laughs> EWTN. Uh, also, our sponsors at Relevant Radio have been doing an excellent job. They're praying the rosary right now for everyone at home. Um, but I, what I've gotten the sense of is that people are excited. They're like, the Holy Spirit is entering living rooms right now. People are getting, like, ignited in their living rooms. Um, those who maybe don't have the health to travel out to Indianapolis um, have felt like they're walking with us side by side. Uh, it, this is not contained to Indianapolis. This is so much bigger than, than this event. This is a, a movement. And so uh, the Holy Spirit is really penetrating the stadium, penetrating the Indiana Convention Center. And uh, yeah, and he's reaching people through through beauty. He's reaching people, his Eucharistic presence. I mean, he's an atomic bomb of grace. Right. And so it's like <laughs> spreading out and, and it's just like wiping people out. So for people who can't uh, travel to Indianapolis or can't be here this week, yeah, you're reaching out to them through social media, through images, through sound, uh, through sight. Uh, what would you encourage people at home to do, like today, to, to participate in the, in the Eucharistic Congress? Yeah, well today we're, we're going into Gethsemane. So today I, I would really encourage those at home to first and foremost uh, go to confession if you haven't been to confession in a while. Sometimes there's things that the Lord wants to do but we block it. And so just going to confession, getting rid of that stuff to open the door for the Lord to move is first and foremost. And then if you can get to mass, that would be excellent and receive our Lord. Uh, at home, if you're in Miami, Florida or if you're in Los Angeles, California, if you go to Mass and you receive communion, you're going to be with us when we're about to receive communion here in just about an hour. Um, and then I would say, um, like, t spend some time in prayer and, like, assess, like, where are those parts in your life that maybe you're, you're holding back, that you're not going all in on, that maybe you have one foot in, one foot out. And uh, dare to ask the Lord to invite you or to invite himself into there. Um, Sometimes we don't want the Lord to do that, but even saying, like, Lord, I want to want mm. right. that can be, like, just enough for him to move. Absolutely. One of the things that's been so striking for us and I think for the viewers at home is the, the, the beauty of just the, the scene, the imagery, the, the videos have been excellent. There's been an aesthetic that feels very modern yeah. and very with it, if you will, but also tying in the ancient of who we are as Catholics and not losing the sense of the traditional in the midst of that. And so as an artist and a, a creative, how, what was the, the process like of trying to, to balance that, of being as modern as possible, if you will, mm. to, to captivate the modern sensibility, but also not losing sight of the kind of the ancient, the good, the true, and the beautiful? Man, can I pop off for a second? Please. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm really passionate about this topic. I think that when you look at the history of art, mm -hmm. we as Catholics have dominated that. Yeah. Like that has been our arena, you know? And it's only been until, until kind of recently where we've kind of fallen in that regards. Mm -hmm. And I think that truth, goodness, and beauty have to go together. Uh, these are the transcendentals. You know, the Greek philosophers talked about this, but truth has to go with goodness and goodness has to be presented with beauty. And I think that um, our secular age, in our secular age, we've presented non-truths but in a very beautiful way. Mm. And we've presented truth in sometimes not the most beautiful way. And when I'm presented with two stories and one has beauty, I'm gonna gravitate towards that. Right. And so I think in, in, in the kind of cultural war, we've been losing out because of that. And so uh, I'm really passionate about like showing truth with goodness and with beauty. Yeah. And so kind of capturing that. And I think you have to adjust that to the age that you're in a little bit. And so, uh, yeah, if you go check out our social media, I mean, we're trying to capture uh, Jesus in a unique way that's with the times, but also in a beautiful and, and reverent way that upholds him as king. 
in, in a way that's outside of time as well. While we have you here, Tanner, I have to ask you about the web series, James the Less. I heard from so many friends who, younger people who discovered EW Chan almost for the first time because of that web series that you starred in and acted oh, awesome. in. Do you mind just giving a short word about, about that series and kind of previewing what's next? Yeah, too. I think it's got the four transcendentals. I think it's got truth, goodness, beauty, and a little bit of humor. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. When you put those together, I mean, you make a loving package. Yeah. Um, but James Les has been such a, a good gift. As an artist, sometimes when you make something, you're like, wow, this, this could be the end of me. I have no idea how this is going to turn out. Uh, but it's sometimes when you do that, that you find that uh, that's actually your best work. And so uh, the team at, at EWTN... Uh, Stephen Beaumont, Michael Mazzini, they've just they've put together something really fun. Mm -hmm. And there's more to come, y'all. They've they've been writing more. James the more. James the more. <laughs> right. James the less and he's even lesser this time. <laughs> right. Oh um, dang. Um, but yeah, no, they've done a great job. They've captured the tone that I think a lot of people fell in love mm -hmm. with with that series. And so uh, I hope I just do my part to bring their vision to life. Absolutely. So what are you taking from the Congress? What am I taking? We're, we're, we're leaving on Sunday, mm -hmm. going back to our ordinary lives. Uh, what do you hope to bring with you? Just a a, a like uh, a bigger flame, hopefully. I want to like I want to reach more people. I want I want to bring them into the flame. I want them to carry a flame that goes and brings others into the flame. Um, I'm just I'm pumped. <laughs> I'm stoked. I'm a little tired right now, so maybe I'm not as stoked as maybe I, I'm really currently feeling. Uh, looking, I, 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 our makeup artist did a great job. I look like a dead <laughs> for man all of us. Here, so. For all of us, Tina. props to her. Uh, but yeah, I, I just, I'm, 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 I want people to know the goodness of God. Yeah. yeah. Well, and one of the things again that I, I just keep noticing around here is the creativity and the intentionality. Mm -hmm. And I know the team was very intentional about being intentional. Uh, and so maybe for the, those watching, what does it look like to stoke that creative fire and that? Again, the church traditionally has been the biggest proponent of the arts mm -hmm. in the Western world, and we'd love to get back to that. So how, how does somebody at home kind of wade into those waters when it often feels very intimidating and kind of the activation energy seems very high to potentially be a creative in the church right now? If you're a creative, create. Like, we need you right now. And I think that the best way is you just got to do it. Sometimes uh, it takes just a lot of fit. My success rate is probably, I was telling someone this the other day, my success rate for anything creative is like 0.03%. Yeah. I mean, I just, I shoot darts left and right and they very rarely stick. Um, but I think we have to have that kind of mindset because that's where you like hone your voice, you hone your style. Um, so if you're a creative at home, create. And, and whatever whatever people think of you, yeah, like that doesn't matter. Trust the Lord. You're doing it for the Lord. No, no one's opinion matters. Yeah. Right now we're hearing the stadium quiet. We're preparing for the Oops. sacrifice of the master. No, no, we're fine. No, we're fine oh. to keep speaking. And, and Father, this is going to be celebrated by Cardinal Wilton Gregory, the Archdiocese of Washington here. And it's a mass of reconciliation. Yeah, fitting for Friday. You know, it's the Friday of the Eucharistic Congress. Again, we, as we said, the theme into Gethsemane. But even the liturgy this morning to focus on, we're celebrating a mass uh, of reconciliation. This is uh, a special set of mm. prayers within the Roman Missal mm -hmm. uh, for the priest to offer for the specific purpose and intention of glorifying the Lord for the reconciliation, the repentance that, that, that he offers us. Absolutely. I was struck by something you said, Tanner, about we're going into Gethsemane, we're going into the wounds to allow the Lord's light to shine. And Pete, you were linking again the suffering with God's glory. Yeah, the glory is coming. The glory is here. Mm -hmm. You can hear the music begin, and there's nothing more glorious than what we're about to partake in. Heaven is opening up over Indianapolis right now, and we get to participate in the glory and the song, the, the triumph of the king. So I can't wait. It's been powerful. Again, we're seeing now, I think it's safe to say, hundreds of priests. Tanner, I don't know if you have the inside information and the stats of how many priests and bishops there are, but... I, I should. <laughs> There's a There's lot. You'll tweet it out later. The quantity yeah. is a lot. A bunch. Don't, yeah, yeah. don't you feel like you're going to war? Yeah. Like, Battling man, when they up. process in, I'm Battling like, up. oh, we're, we're getting this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get pumped. No, it's, a it's an army of priests. priests. Yeah, yeah. phalanx yeah. of priests. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we take you now to morning mass here at the National Eucharistic Congress.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Dearest brothers and sisters in the Lord, to prepare our hearts to attentively listen to the word of God, and then to share together the bread of life, let us ask the Father to forgive our sins. I confess to Almighty God, to my brothers and sisters, that I have really sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my mysterious fault. Therefore, I ask that Mary the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. God of mercy and reconciliation, who offer your people special days of salvation so that they may recognize you as creator and father of all. Mercifully come to our help, we pray, so that receiving gladly from you the message of peace, we may serve your will to restore all things in Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the first letter of St. John. Beloved, this is the message that we have heard from Jesus Christ and proclaim to you, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with God while we continue to walk in darkness, we lie and do not act in truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we are without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we acknowledge our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins, and cleanse us from every wrongdoing. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My children, I am writing this to you so that you might not commit sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is expiation for our sins and not for our sins only, 
but for those of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Haciendo lo que a tus ojos era malo.
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Jesus said to his disciples, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to all these things. The Gospel of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Among those first and well-known creative acts of God that are portrayed in the book of Genesis was the Lord's initial separation of light from darkness. That process is still an ongoing task that God continues to undertake in our midst even today. There may be countless occasions when many people might feel that the primal darkness has indeed somehow managed to prevail over light. Our Eucharistic Congress seeks to reaffirm and to intensify the light that illuminates the truth of Christ's unique and enduring presence in the most blessed sacrament. Too many recent surveys and studies suggest that the darkness of doubt and denial has cast an unwelcome shadow over the once widespread acceptance of our church's heritage of faith in the real presence. Ours is not the only moment in church history to raise questions about the reality of Christ's distinctive and persisting presence in the Eucharist. From time to time, this same concern has entered our ecclesial life great pastors, mystics, and learned theologians have attempted to offer explanations regarding the truth of this great gift. Often, however, it is the uncomplicated faith of ordinary people that serves as an assurance of the wonder of this gift. Still, each age must come to grips with the profound truth that is Christ's Eucharistic presence. However, believing in Christ's genuine Eucharistic presence must also prompt our equally important active response to that presence in charity 
in each of our lives offered in service and with care for others. For without that response, the sincerity of our earnest reverence for the Blessed Sacrament will fail to capture the essence of why Christ chooses to remain with us by way of this wondrous presence. The most prolonged and profound adoration moments will be inadequate unless they direct us to deeds of kindness towards others. This Eucharistic gift must prompt us to live as does the compassionate Christ, who chooses to remain in our midst under the forms of bread and wine. The highest forms and acts of charity, the determined pursuit of social justice, and the genuine compassionate outreach toward the poor and the neglected, generated from a belief in and as a response to Christ's Eucharistic presence is a spiritual journey. It is the light that comes from faith, the brilliance that comes as a response to that faith. St. John reminds us that we are called to walk in the light of truth and not to continue to amble along in the darkness of sin, ignorance, and indifference. Many of you arrived at this Eucharistic Congress having walked with the presence of the Blessed Sacrament throughout your neighborhoods as pilgrims. The paths that led us to this assembly came from the four corners of our nation. As people carried the Eucharistic Lord, traveling through the communities of our country, we prayed that we might renew our love, our awareness, and our respect for the special gift of his presence. We also prayed that your journeys may have allowed you to see many curious onlookers who might have gazed at you or may have directed questions to you about what you were hoping to achieve with this procession. Those chance encounters were also opportunities for you to reflect on the reasons that brought about your participation in that journey of faith, a renewal and deepening of our acceptance of Christ's Eucharistic presence in our midst. Perhaps you witnessed, you, perhaps your witness to Christ's presence may have rekindled the faith of some people who might have watched your, sp your spiritual journey. Maybe it even helped some individuals to think about their own forgotten or neglected faith heritage. Whatever it might have accomplished, it was well worth the trip. Along the journey, you no doubt came face to face with a number of homeless people who frequently live on the streets, in parks, under bridges. They too are a genuine reflection of Christ himself as he reminds us. Seeing them, may our hearts be softened and our eyes open to his genuine presence among the poor. Carrying the Eucharistic Christ through some of the depressed areas of our nation was also an important dimension of the journey that brought so many of us here to this venue in Indianapolis, Indiana. Many of you came to this event as pilgrims, following the Lord in processions. The adventure of a pilgrimage 
is a religious legacy for many different faith traditions. It is an ancient holy custom. The English poet Geoffrey Chaucer wrote his most famous work, The Canterbury Tales, about pilgrims on the journey to the shrine of Thomas a Becket, describing many of them in humorous and often in less than complimentary ways. This famous poem, this story of pilgrims, is nearly 800 years old. Our Muslim brothers and sisters, even today, also long to make a religious pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca during their lifetime. Some of you may have also been on the Camino pilgrimage to Compostela to visit the shrine of St. James. In each of those journeys, people travel to visit a holy place, a shrine, or a church, which is the ultimate goal of their voyage. On your journey to Indianapolis, you were bringing the very one who is himself our desired end and spiritual goal, the way, the truth, and the life. You brought him along with him, uh, with yourselves in his Eucharistic presence. Jesus is on the pilgrimage journey accompanying us, and not merely as the end of the journey, but as one who travels the spiritual path along with us. Like the Lord God once accompanied his people during their time in the desert. Christ will never leave us as we travel with him as sacrament and ultimate goal. He is truly present in each step of our life as present precious sacrament and enduring guide. He stays with us as a companion and as food for the journey. He is the light of the world, and there is no darkness within him. God's work of separating light from darkness has Christ as the ultimate triumph and the completion of that task born, born and begun in those first moments of creation. God, indeed, has separated darkness from light, and his Son is the light. Amen. Trusting in the Father's mercy, let us confidently approach the throne of grace and turn to him with our petitions. For our Holy Father, Pope Francis, and all those entrusted to preach the message of mercy, may they draw many hearts to encounter the saving love of God. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those weighed down by the burden of sin, that they would find healing 
and true freedom in the sacrament of confession. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. That forgiveness would reign in our families, our communities, and in our world. And that peace would come down on those places where innocent lives are in danger. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. Having encountered Christ's mercy, may the Holy Spirit inspire us with missionary zeal to bring home all those who have fallen away from Christ and his church. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. Through frequent and worthy reception of Holy Communion, may we all be strengthened to resist temptation and reject sin. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And we pray for all the faithful departed. Through God's mercy, may they be welcomed into their eternal dwelling place. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, in your compassion, be attentive to our petitions and answer the prayers of your church, which we ask through your Son, Jesus, our Lord.
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice with your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our benefit of all of his holy church. Remember, Lord, that your Son, who is our peace and our reconciliation, has canceled the sin of the world with his, with his blood. And as you look mercifully on your church's offerings, grant that we who joyfully celebrate this time of grace may extend to all the freedom of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to give you thanks, truly just to give you glory, Father most holy. For you are the one God, living and true, existing before all ages and abiding for all eternity, dwelling in unapproachable light. Yet you, who alone are good, the source of life, have made all that is, so that you might fill your creatures with blessings and bring joy to many of them by the glory of your light. And so in your presence are countless hosts of angels who serve you day and night, and gazing upon the glory of your face, glorify you without ceasing. With them we too confess your name in exaltation, giving voice to every creature under heaven as we acclaim. We give you praise, Father most holy, for you are great, and you have fashioned all of your works in wisdom and in love. You formed man in your own image and entrusted the whole world to his care, so that in serving you alone, the Creator, he might have dominion over all creatures. And when, through disobedience, he had lost your friendship. You did not abandon him to the domain of death, for you came in mercy to aid to the aid of all, so that those who seek might find you. Time and again you offered them covenants, and through the prophets taught them to look forward to salvation. And you so love the world, Father most holy, that in the fullness of time, you sent your only begotten Son to be our Savior, made incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He shared our human nature in all things but sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners, freedom, and to the sorrowful of heart, joy. To accomplish your plan, he gave himself up to death, and rising from the dead, he destroyed death and restored life. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again for us, 
he sent the Holy Spirit from you, Father, as the first fruits for those who believe, so that bringing to perfection his work in the world, he might sanctify creation to the full. Therefore, O Lord, we pray, may this same Holy Spirit graciously sanctify these offerings, that they may become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the celebration of this great mystery, which he himself left us as an eternal covenant. For when the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, Father most holy, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And while they were at supper, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, taking the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, he gave thanks and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of Therefore, O Lord, as we now celebrate the memorial of our redemption, we remember Christ's death and his descent to the realm of the dead. We proclaim his resurrection and his ascension to your right hand. And as we await his coming in glory, we offer you his body and blood, the sacrifice acceptable to you which brings salvation to the whole world. Look, O Lord, upon the sacrifice which you yourself have provided for your church and grant in your loving kindness to all who partake of the one bread and the one chalice that gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, they may truly become a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your glory. Therefore, Lord, we remember now all for whom we offer this sacrifice, especially your servant, Francis, our Pope, Charles, our Bishop, and the whole order of bishops, all the clergy, 
those who take part in this offering, those gathered here before you, your entire people, and all who seek you with a sincere heart. Remember also those who have died in the peace of your Christ and all the dead whose faith you alone have known. To all of us, your children, grant, O merciful Father, that we may enter into a heavenly inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your apostles and saints in your kingdom, there with the whole of creation, freed from the corruption of sin and death, may we glorify you through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those 
call to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. May the sacrament of your Son, which we have received, increase our strength, we pray, O Lord, that from this mystery of unity we may drink deeply of your love's power and everywhere promote your peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.
welcome back to EWTN's ongoing live coverage of the 10th National Eucharistic Congress. I'm Catherine Hadro, coming to you from Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis, and once again joined by my two co-hosts, Father Aquinas Gilbo, University Chaplain at the Catholic University of America, and Pete Barak, Vice President at Renewal Ministries. And we just participated in the morning mass here in Lucas Oil Stadium, celebrated by Cardinal Wilton Gregory, and it was a mass of reconciliation. Another beautiful liturgy here at the National Eucharistic Congress, beautiful music, great preaching. If people at home were listening, though, you probably noticed something a little different from a typical Mass, and that was the Eucharistic prayer. It's not one that we hear often. Most people know we have the four commonly used prayers in the Roman Missal, but there are two others, two for Masses for Reconciliation, which some parishes or pastors might choose to use them during Lent, but we don't hear them all that much. But a fitting choice here for this Friday during the Eucharistic Congress, a day in which we're focusing on the Lord and His prayer in Gethsemane, focusing on reconciliation and penance. That's the lens through which Cardinal Gregory led us in prayer today. Yes, and again, a perfect for today's theme, which is Into Gethsemane, where we're going to focus on the wounds of Jesus and our own wounds as well. Um, the, the procession in and out was just stunning to see in and of itself. You know, I've learned that there are more than 1,000 priests who are registered here, 200 bishops and cardinals. Uh, Pete, your thoughts on the homily and the Mass? Again, it's just, it's so inspiring to see the church represented healthy and strong and, and together. And then Cardinal Gregory gave us a really wonderful reminder that the adoration of the Lord is important, but it needs to translate into action and in, in acts of service and looking for the wounds, not just in our own heart, but in the world and how we can be Christ's healing presence in the world. And so he, he reminded us quite strongly that Yes, we need to adore the Lord, but we also need to be looking for Him in the poor, in the marginalized, in, in those who might be otherwise overlooked by society. There should be this transformation for all of us and a transformation of the world because of Jesus in the Eucharist. Simultaneous to this Mass that we broadcast here, there was also a youth Mass over at the Indianapolis Convention Center celebrated by Archbishop Brolio and a Spanish Mass as well celebrated by Archbishop Perez. And participants here are being asked to spend 15 minutes of their time to feed the local hungry here in Indiana. It's all part of the Million Meal Movement, which strives to be the hands and feet of Christ for those in need. Mark Irons has that report. What happens when your time in Eucharistic adoration is up or when Mass is over after you've been spiritually fed? For these Catholics, it's time to feed others. Because um, I just want to like help people. Just think this what Jesus would do. We're blessed and we have a lot and it's important to give back. We've spoken to plenty of people who say that receiving Christ in the Eucharist or spending time in adoration should naturally lead to service where love of God would then spill over to love of neighbor. These participants at the National Eucharistic Congress are packing up meals for those in need throughout the state of Indiana and my job on this assembly line is to scoop up the macaroni. On the menu now, macaroni and cheese, and later, rice casserole. These packaged meals made ready to go to those who need them most. The volunteers are on a mission to stuff, seal, and box 360,000 meals over two days at the National Eucharistic Congress, preparing them to be shipped to food pantries. And so we were excited about doing it together as a family. Brent Kudron brought his family along. His young daughter makes sure there's just enough noodles inside each bag. Being Catholic is being part of a community, and so this is something that shows that it's, it's, it's a community. We're helping people out. We have a faith component. It's, it's a lifestyle and not just going to church on Sundays. This volunteer assembly line event put on by the Million Meal Movement, a nonprofit working to eradicate hunger in the state of Indiana. Inside the exhibit hall of the Eucharistic Congress, participants can stop in and give as much time as they want. I just wanted to dedicate at least an hour here to our Lord and uh, give back his love to me to others. Volunteer Oscar Lopez believes it makes sense to have this meal packing project accessible adjacent to Lucas Oil Stadium where tens of thousands of Catholics are receiving Christ in the Eucharist. He has given everything in the Eucharist to us so you know it's perfectly normal for us to just give back to him in service you know to others. What's the connection between the Eucharist and service? Well, I mean, Christ's whole life is service, and we're all children of God, and if you're not reaching out helping people, it's really easy to lose sight of that and worry about your own agenda. 
The gospel mandate to serve others is not a concept lost on young Catholic Elin Burnett. That's what Jesus did for us, so it's important for us to do it for other people too. We wanted to come over here and then we saw what it was and we wanted to help. These volunteer participants believe small acts of love can go a long way. Sometimes all it takes is just a scoop. If everyone does something little, then the difference will be big. Mark Irons, EWTN News. That's amazing to see that that is happening here simultaneously to the talks, to the sacraments all around us, and to see those young families as well. Yeah, it's very scriptural, right? Where does mm -hmm. Jesus talks about different places that we encounter him, and one of the ways he talks about it is in the least of these. You know, did you feed the hungry? Did you clothe the naked? Did you visit those in prisons? Because when we do, what is his promise? You encounter me. Mm -hmm. And any of us who've done any amounts of service in the eyes of the poor and the people that we're serving, but, uh, so often we, we come to those moments thinking we're giving something. Mm -hmm. And in reality, so often we receive something from the Lord. And so there's, again, it's the body of Christ at work, right. Father. No, I think that we can feel this tension too in our own lives, right? Mm -hmm. Between going to Mass and undertaking acts of service or performing the works of mercy. We might even see it in our parishes where people might separate into groups. These are the mass goers. These are the, the service and justice right. folks. Uh, Cardinal Gregory reminded us that that's a false separation. It's a false dichotomy that there's an unbreakable relation between faith and charity, between adoration mm -hmm. and service. And I really think that's a witness that the American church can give to the world and maybe to pay attention to the witness especially the holy women that the Lord has brought up in our own nation mm -hmm. over our, our history. Just think of St. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Ann Seton, uh, St. Catherine Drexel, mm -hmm. Mother Mary Lang, Dorothy yes. Day. These are women who spent hours in adoration before the Blessed Sacrament, and that translated into hours of service to Christ's poor. Uh, and that's a lesson we all have to learn individually, but especially in our parishes, in our schools, to bring these two aspects of the faith in, into real perfect union, mm -hmm. adoration, service, faith, charity. And in fact, the busier you are and the more you're serving, the more you need to be fed yourself exactly. through the sacraments. And again, what that report from Mark, seeing that, that link between the Eucharist and then the acts of service, that's exactly what Cardinal Gregory was hitting on in his mm -hmm. homily. He was saying that the Eucharist must prompt us to action, to kindness, to ultimately to be more like Christ. He also reflected on the National Eucharistic Pilgrimages right. and the witness that that provided. Um, you know, he said, you know, your witness may have been this face of Christ for the homeless who were out there on the streets. I will say, again, I was able to join parts of the Eastern Seton route, which went through DC mm -hmm. uh, at different times. And when we were in Baltimore, you had people just in the streets of Baltimore coming out, checking out their windows, people kind of waving to us from the streets. What is this strange procession that is happening here that is so countercultural? But I was also reminded, you mentioned St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, I did not realize, and I, I shame on me, this American-born saint, she converted because of witnessing a Eucharistic pilgrimage, a procession. She saw the Eucharist, she instinctively knelt down mm -hmm. and knew, she knew that Jesus was there and that led to her conversion, which by the way, um, made her a social outcast in her social circles as well. No, she suffered both for the service that she gave to the poor, but especially for her conversion to the faith and her, her adoration of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. Yeah, well, and as the, as the culture drifts further and further from the Lord and from the church, mm -hmm. it's those moments where we kind of remind the world, no, we're still here and we still believe this. Mm -hmm. And it's very arresting. It's very kind of confounding. What is this thing? What is it a parade? Is it a procession? What am I supposed to do? But it stirs in the heart for those who are hungry, a desire to respond. And that's so much of what the church is trying to offer, a, a chance to respond. Absolutely. And that is so linked as well, to give ourselves to the Lord, to receive what he has to say, and then to go out there on mission. All right, well, we're going to continue our ongoing coverage, but first we're taking a quick break. Stay with us.